side. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Contemporary Issues Forum today. My name is Kim Weichel. I'm co-chair of Contemporary Issues Forum, along with my husband, Carl, who is our tech person today. We host several programs a month from noon to one on Zoom. Um, our next program will be actually next week, February 6th, with Peter Wilson, who's an RRUC member, speaking about, are we facing the first great war of the 21st century regarding Russia and Ukraine? Before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to encourage everyone to please be on mute. You're welcome to put questions in the chat throughout his talk, and I will read them or summarize them at the end. And if we have time, we'll open it up for live questions. So I'm delighted to introduce Sam Worthington today, who is a longtime RRUC member, as well as CEO of Interaction, the nation's largest alliance of international NGOs focused on people and shaping humanitarian responses around the world. He is someone who deeply cares about this work and is very committed to making the world a better place. I had the great fortune of speaking with him in a lay-led service some years ago and I could absolutely experience his deep commitment and caring. So Sam, welcome, delighted you're with us today. Well, thank you, Kim, and, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, be with you in the middle of this uh, cold day. So no matter where in the world, no matter how horrific the circumstances, there are always individuals and in local communities that are trying to help their neighbors. In many ways, our world's well-being, at least for us most vulnerable people, is founded on this innate desire of countless people around the world to act and try to improve human dignity in many ways, our Unitarian principle. And until this last decade, human well-being, take an indicator like the number of girls in school or the percentage of humanity no longer in extreme poverty has been steadily improving. We've, in, we've avoided famines, uh, fewer people are starving or dying. Life expectancy has grown pretty much everywhere as did access to basic health. And the momentum to improve basic needs and promote human dignity was for decades on a positive trajectory. I often could say we are now living in the best time in my life. But today, for the first time in my life, we are seeing an overall decline in human welfare. And there are two reasons for this trend has been reversed, and at least for now. The first are natural calamities. You know, the biggest right now is the economic impact of COVID and the pandemic. And natural disasters, most of them caused by climate change. And the second, which is the most harmful for individuals, and started with Syria and now in Yemen and Afghanistan, are the consequences of war and the different forms of human conflict. In many ways, we're prepared better than ever to respond to disasters. And it's just that complex emergencies are expanding at a rate that far exceeds the political will to respond. For 70 years now, we've learned how to respond to humanitarian emergencies. And some key lessons have been incorporated into our efforts. And at the heart of any effective international effort to aid people rests the work of local individuals and institutions. They become the staff, they are the partners, and they, in essence, shape what is possible on the ground. I occasionally get asked the question, how I, as perhaps as an optimist, how do I remain optimistic about human prospects? After all, you know, in the aftermath of war or another calamity, what I quite see can be quite horrific. My answer is inevitably based on the positive things I've seen individuals do for their fellow human beings is the passion of a Darfuri as he helps keep families alive that is replicated around the world. Babe. It's all right, I'll just have to sit here and listen. In a humanitarian setting, one cannot get up and solely describe to understand a magnitude of a problem or get caught into the realities of a particular context. That's not enough. For us, we must act. And any professional and international aid organization must swiftly shift to seeing what is possible, what, what can be done, no matter how imperfect or how challenging the circumstances. Your job is to try to make a difference in lives that have been destroyed or turned upside down. Your response is inevitably imperfect. 
it's easy to critique from afar, but any aid worker knows that the work is essential. Our world is a mess, but there's far more that we can actually do to change that reality than resting on pessimistic assessments from afar. When you think of natural, you know, humanitarian emergency, one tends to shift and think of natural disasters like the Earth recent uh, volcano we saw in Togo or the events of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti and, or the massive tsunami in 2004, or the impact of hurricanes that hit our own country. And for years, I focused on natural disasters. A while back in the week after Hurricane George, it was a category four hurricane that hit the Dominican Republic in 1998. I was making my way down the coast south of Santiago. The road had just been cleared and as far as I could see, trees and structures were reduced to a landscape that resembled a broken matchsticks. And I watched as a man headed into that destruction set on trying to return his things at least to some form of normal. He wanted to help clean up and he probably wanted to help rebuild his home and life. But the only thing he was carrying was a rake. Now the will to move on to rebuild was there, but he needed the tools to become part of a broader response. At the time I was working for an international NGO called Plan International, which forms partnerships and we worked with communities that last for 10 to 15 years. And a decade later, I drove down that same road. All traces of destruction were gone. Communities had been rebuilt. People were focused on their economic well-being, on the health of their children. And now mainly bounced to a different context. And this was the response to the AIDS pandemic. In around 2000, at the height of the AIDS pandemic in Uganda, villages around Tororo had been decimated. In some places, 40% of the adult population had died. I've never seen death on that scale. Every household had been harmed by the disease. Some had disappeared entirely. And to meet parents who are dying and the only hope they could offer their children is a safe home with someone else. And across Africa, tens of millions of children had lost their parents. And once again, people coped and tried to move on. And the solution was entirely local. Millions of grandmothers stepped in to raise large families. And I met one woman who was caring for 17 children. Entire villages pitched in. Aid support groups cared for each other and the terminally ill. And electricity in a village with no electricity or running water and incredibly poor, I've never witnessed greater levels of community support for the most vulnerable neighbors who are sick. And eventually we all know that Western antiretroviral drugs arrived into a massive government program known as PEPFAR, which was launched by President W. Bush. International NGOs and governments were able to reach even the most remote communities. And this effort saved millions of lives. AIDS is still endemic across Africa and other parts of the world, but people can now live with the disease and it's no longer a guaranteed death sentence. And if you fast forward another seven years, I'm now standing on a port and as far as I could see, Banda Aceh looks like it's been hit by a nuclear bomb. The tsunami has flattened the city, killing some 130,000 people in this province alone, and everything has been razed to the ground. On the far away, I could see a boat resting on a house. And a week later, I was witnessing the same level of destruction on just a smaller scale in Hambantota, Sri Lanka, where a market I had visited years earlier was reduced to a slab of concrete by the tsunami. The destruction of a tsunami is hard to fathom. But my clearest memories of 2005 was not the power of nature. It was the lost shoe of a child and the will and the passion of a people to recreate, to rebuild, to rebuild their homes and communities. Up the coast from Banda Aceh and destroyed villages, thousands of people were organized by Habitat for Humanity and actively rebuilding homes and communities and lives. It takes more than a tsunami to erase a village. When a disaster hits a city, the story is much the same. After the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, buildings had been pancakes and whole hillsides were covered of houses that were reduced to rubble. 
You could smell the destruction everywhere and see the desperation of people living in makeshift camps and every open space around Port-au-Prince. When I returned six months later, the same pattern of locally led responses and partnership with international NGOs had repeated itself. I visited communities in hillsides where hundreds of homes were being rebuilt and people were moving out of camps. With the help of the international NGO Catholic Relief Services, entrepreneurs were using a rock crusher to grind the rubble of houses and then sell it what was left to make cement for the rebuilding effort. In response to all this, the world has built a humanitarian infrastructure. And a UN Undersecretary General serves as the world's top humanitarian relief coordinator. And he chairs something known as the Interagency Standing Committee, or the ISC. It's made up of many independent UN agencies, including the World Food Program, UNICEF, UN High Commission of Refugees, and it partners with large international NGOs some have common names like Save the Children, the International Rescue Committee, Oxfam or CARE, and others like Relief International, IMC are less well known. And then part of this infrastructure is the Global Red Cross, Red Cross Crescent Movement in the International Committee on the Red Cross. I've served as a representative on this steering group for the past 15 years, and it shapes the global humanitarian response and what we call the humanitarian system. Together, these three groups, the UN, the Red Cross, and the NGOs have built a humanitarian infrastructure that's capable of helping millions. And we've done this under the broad framework of international humanitarian law and based on four principles. The first is humanity. It's a focus on human suffering no matter where it's found. The second is neutrality. We don't take sides in a conflict. The third is impartiality, actions, are taken based on need alone. And lastly, independence. We need to remain independent of any political, military, or other objective. And built on these principles, the humanitarian system has learned and it evolves. From the mistakes made during the Haiti earthquake, a different approach was tried in response to Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. And that response was far more rooted in the capacities of local organizations and people. Again, it had flaws, but we saw significant improvements in the ability of the world to respond and help hundreds of thousands of people within a very short period of time. Our challenge though, is not how well we could learn to respond to these natural disasters. For all the horrors that we've seen or I've talked about in terms of large scale national humanitarian crises, the reality is that the impact of violence and war. I remember flying into Darfur and Al Fasher on a World Food Program plane, and one could see out the window, village after village, round circles burnt to the ground, each blackened by flames, each destroyed by the Janjaweed and Hatak helicopters of the Sudanese military. At the height of that crisis, some 2 million people needed food assistance every day. And every day, another woman would make it to the crisis center, joining thousands of others who were raped as a tool of war. Here in Darfur, the humanitarian response was outside the wire. The protection offered by UN forces only around cities, not where you worked. You get to the camp in a car with a large no weapons logo on the doors. All four wheel drive vehicles have been put up on blocks and decommissioned as the Janjaweed tried to mount them with heavy machine guns. The people that lived in the camps were open to daily attacks and security comes for aid efforts by knowing which road you could drive down and which you should avoid. Now Darfur is fall calmer today, but it's an example of a complex emergency in the midst of violence it has become the norm whether it's in Yemen and Afghanistan and Syria, Venezuela, the DRC, Somalia, Myanmar, and the list grows. Today, we face dozens of large, complex humanitarian emergencies. And here is the challenge. When a tsunami hits or a fire rages, we respond with care, and we support those who must flee and who have lost everything. And yet, when a family's home is bombed, 
or where an army comes through a village and systematically raping and killing, we do nothing. The horrors of war are too much to absorb and we unconsciously blame the victim. Your society is at war, you are at fault. We in the North tend to look for someone to blame, losing faith in our ability to help those most in need. An appeal for support by an NGO to help the victims of a tsunami or earthquake will raise millions of dollars. The same NGO will have troubles raising a few hundred thousand for people displaced by war. And our challenge is that all our current complex emergencies are in some ways like Darfur. And the only difference today is that the public has given up and looks the other way. There is no save Tigray or save Yemen campaign. Afghanistan does clip closer to home. And we're focusing on the great need of Afghans coming here to the United States. But we cannot just focus on that minute percentage of people who made it out. The Afghan people need our support. And here's the humanitarian reality we're living through. And it's nicely summarized by my colleague, David Miliband, who's the former UK foreign secretary and now the CEO of the International Rescue Committee. He argues that states are failing in their duties to citizens. Diplomacy is failing to resolve conflicts. The legal regime is failing to protect well-established rights of civilians and humanitarian operations are failing to fill the widening gaps. At a global level, we have a record number of people in humanitarian assistance and a record number of people fleeing their homes. This year, we anticipate that some 274 million people will need humanitarian assistance and protection. And it's a level that we've not seen since the Second World War. Every day that our system for guaranteeing peace and prosperity human suffering grows. And increasingly numbers of aid workers are killed and we try to save millions of lives, but business as usual is not enough. A record 80 million people have been forced to flee their homes, 41 million people on the brink of famine and humanitarian assistance needs have increased by 63% in just two years. And let me focus just on two areas, hunger and displacement. According to the World Food Program, conflict is not just the leading cause of hunger, but in many cases, hunger is being used as a deliberate weapon of war, as a way to break the will of opposition groups. And we all know that climate change is a critical threat as temperatures get higher and wildfires and regular rainfalls, flooding and droughts to help drive up food insecurity to unprecedented levels. And the most marginalized people on earth have had no role in creating this climate crisis. They are faced with its most severe consequences. As we all adapt to a changing climate, we cannot accept a future where the inequities are simply exacerbated by what is happening to others. And to make matters worse, COVID-19 and particularly economic shots have set back progress towards ending hunger by at least five years. This is the setback at least during my lifetime, where we're seeing progress towards the eradication of hunger moving in the wrong direction. And displacement, this is the ability to force people from their homes due to violence, oppressions, economic or social and climatic shocks, is currently displacing some 80 million people. And the sad thing is when someone becomes a refugee outside their country, they tend to remain refugees on average for 19 years. And some 50 million people are displaced also within their countries. Most of the people who were refugees remain in poor economic hardship in camps, and they are hosted by the poorest countries on earth. A million of this 30 or so million who were became refugees tried to get Europe into Europe and it created a massive crisis. This year, the United States will let in 120,000 people. The previous administration had reduced that number pretty much to zero. And among these refugees and internally displaced people, women and girls are the least safe. In transgender roles, structural inequalities, exposing women and girls to greater risk of food insecurity and hunger. 
But this is the macro picture. Let me bring it down to the reality of a few countries. And I'll start with Ethiopia. A war in and around Tigray is now the world's most acute displacement and humanitarian crisis. And its ethnic cleansing will likely dwarf our Darfur. 9.2 million people need emergency food assistance. And we, as part of the UN or international aid NGOs, have no access at all. There is a full blockade of any food or supplies getting into Tigray. Recently, a member of my staff did make it into Tigray. I'm one of the last UN convoys to get to Mekele, which is the capital. They were stopped and searched multiple times by military checkpoints. Their drivers were arrested, then released, and then re-arrested again. Everything in the convoy was searched and taken off the trucks and put back in. And eventually they're forced back as you don't want to be driving through a war zone at night. She then repeated the same process the next day and finally made it into McKinley. Their communications are down. Food was very limited. There was no cash. My colleague, who is a very experienced aid worker, said the horrors she saw along the road were only the worst she's ever seen. And outside McKinley, no one knows how many are starving. The World Food Program has not declared a famine, and it's impossible to get data. To declare a famine, you need data to establish the number of people starving has reached 20% of all households. And we can't reach any household. Catholic Relief Services, CARE, and other NGOs in the International Committee for the Red Cross are in Mekele and right across the border in South Sudan. And they have large capacity to help millions of people immediately. They could get in medicines and food to a population in dire need, but they are stopped from doing so. So it's this issue of lack of access, even more than a lack of resources that is often the largest barrier to humanitarian assistance around the world. Humanitarian assistance requires the political will and political pressure to force space for it to happen. We have pushed the Biden administration, the UN Security Council and other governments to make Tigray a top priority. Our efforts were noticed, the Ethiopian government did not like them and several aid agencies had to suspend their operations because they were attacks from Ethiopian backed forces. And eventually Secretary Blinken declared the war and ethnic cleansing, which shook things up diplomat diplomatically. And pressure was building in the UN elsewhere against the Ethiopian government and as it ignored pleas, it found itself cornered. We were making some progress, but then Afghanistan happened. And so we had to turn to the next crisis. Today, the Afghan economy is spiraling collapse. And without help, the population will face acute food insecurity by this March. A total of some 8 million people may be face starvation this winter. A colleague from Save the Children was recently in Kabul noted that a teacher's child was starving because she hadn't been paid for months by the government. Not because they don't want to pay her. The Taliban has no money. The collapse is the result of cutting off the Taliban from the global financial system. And the challenge is reestablishing a viable banking connection that meets counterterrorism norms. And even as President Biden is committed to humanitarian assistance to Afghan people, the main obstacle to humanitarian relief remains at this point in time, Western governments. There are many large NGOs with thousands of local staff in and up throughout Afghanistan. Before August, 2021, we reached about 6 million people of humanitarian assistance. It was hard to operate. And as you can imagine during a war, and it limits what you can do. Today, international NGOs actually have good access across the country and functioning communications with the Taliban. These NGOs continue to employ and pay women and work in schools that educate girls. And yet for months, it's been impossible to get cash into the country. We've been negotiating with senior Biden officials to remove international barriers and to help them find a way to move cash into a country 
where the skills needed to run a central bank and international cash transfers have all fled. Our efforts to remove these regulatory barriers have been in many ways successful. Many NGOs have what the Treasury calls OFAC or Office of Foreign Asset Control licenses that allow us to work with and around organizations that are considered terrorist. Now, thanks to our advocacy push, the Biden administration has removed anti-terrorism regulatory barriers that have hindered our operation, and they're trying to create some system to get humanitarian funds in. Three weeks ago, with our support and pressure, the US was successful in getting the UN Security Council to drop the UN's anti-terror policies for Afghanistan. The goal here is to help the Afghan people and government while not funding the Taliban, and that can be done. But we still don't have a way to bank humanitarian assistance. Some funding we are getting moving through Hawalas or through the World Bank, but the amount is far too small. A few hundred million dollars does not keep a country afloat. Massive liquidity is needed and aid dollars and the dollars of the reserves of the Afghan National Bank are stuck. And as we wait and to try to figure out how to get cash in, people are starving. Just to fund the current food distribution in Afghanistan, the World Food Program estimates that we need to move in about $250 million a month. So I've given you this harsh reality, and it's sometimes difficult to hear about, to listen to, and to recognize as we live our lives. But we've learned that in complex emergencies, you can save lives, you can help people rebuild, you, you can protect civilians, and you can give people hope. This infrastructure we've built does make a difference. And most importantly, with local partners, you can oftentimes get access in ways that international responders cannot get, whether it's in the DRC or Yemen or Syria. To Boko Haram controlled areas in Nigeria, millions of lives are being saved. We make a significant difference even in these emergencies. Last year, the UN and these international aid NGOs reached 170 million people with life saving assistance and basic supplies. And it's roughly about 70% of the target population we tried to reach. And our challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is on what's possible what can be done in these circumstances. And unfortunately, it also comes down to resources. Are Western governments willing to help? We are investing trillions of dollars into our own welfare and to fight inequality here at home. At the same time, the international humanitarian system has become a game of triage. More resources for food in Afghanistan means less resources in Yemen. Reaching 70% of the need is great, but where the resources go is at the mercy of politics and the limits of scarcity. It's about triage, choosing who could live and who must die. Right before COVID hit, I was in Cox Bazar, which is a group of camps holding about 900,000 Rohingya living now right across the border in Bangladesh. The camps are well run. Close to a million people are fed every day, people in the camps and around the camps. Girls and boys are learning to read and write, and now some of them even speak English. Traditions are being maintained. Life is not good, but it's livable, and we are doing our job. The Rohingya need to return home, which is a complex political problem. And to make things worse, the regime in Myanmar is now targeting other ethnic groups with the same tactics it used to displace the Rohingya by burning villages. And there too, we're trying to figure out our problems of access. But as we wait for a political solution, let's not cut the aid that the Rohingya receive. And the question is, for how long can we wait? Humanitarian diplomacy is essential to solve the Rohingya's future, but we do not want Cox Bazaar to become another city slum a generation from now. We must find the political will to care, to act, to find durable solutions. None of this is possible if populations in affluent countries look the other way. I cannot accept a world where we do not take additional action to help people displaced by drought, 
by floods, or most importantly, by conflict that have caused them to flee their homes, often caused by authoritarian leaders. So I try to do something, and I do what I can to strengthen the humanitarian movement and its ability to help those who have lost everything. And you too can try to make a difference. There are countless ways to help. Thank you. Wow, <clears throat> Sam, thank you so much. Those were such moving stories from your remarkable career, as well as an overview of current humanitarian needs. So I'm gonna ask a question before I do, I'll say, please feel free to um, add questions into the chat. So let me start with a big question, Sam. You know, how do we, after we you, you've been a CEO of Interaction for 15 years, you've traveled around the world, you've been involved in this humanitarian infrastructure. How do we it, increase the political will for a humanitarian assistance at a time when you say humanitarian needs have increased by 63%? Um, all countries have signed on to the sustainable development goals to, to eliminate extreme poverty and have made a deep commitment. Yet, as you rightly point out, the political will is often not there in terms of support in many ways. So how do we increase the political will? I think part of it is in the challenge during this time of COVID is that we tend to look inward and move in our, our homes, our lives are reduced to much smaller communities. And unless we remain internationally linked, unless we recognize that our reality and suffering here at home is being replicated in more complex ways in other places around the world and recognize the need for a multilateral multinational system out there we head in the wrong direction so it's about electing leaders who care about the world beyond our borders polls done of the american people show large numbers of individuals support the concept of the un or the concept of international assistance to help the most vulnerable. So it's creating that will and supporting organizations who push for something you care about, whether it's women or girls or a particular set of refugees uh, or health or access to vaccines. There are lots of organizations pushing and politically moving in that direction. But it comes down to ultimately, can you create some form of movement and we've created things like the one campaign or others that have made international poverty something that we all talk about, whereas 20 years ago, this was not something we discussed. So we've slowly built this movement to have people care, to have people engage. And occasionally that movement catches fire, like Save Darfur, where you're seeing congregations and temples and synagogues around the country moving and saying, we must do something about this. Something is wrong here. And it's not just punishing those who have committed crimes against humanity. It is looking at and recognizing that something must be done. It takes more than having a child wash up on a beach in Greece, dead, who's a refugee, to recognize that something had to be done, has, must be done with Syrians. I was across the border relatively recently in, in Turkey. And the crisis is there. They have a million Syrians around the area. Our challenge is that we've decided that this is too difficult to do anything about. It's too hard, too complex. We need to imagine the hope that they need and provide some of that, offer something that's possible. And by getting leaders who care, support them in doing what they can. The US has stepped up massively under this current administration and it can do more. We're hoping that it will double the amount of assistance it provides around the world for these types of problems. So yes, it comes down to the slow political process of making something real and asking someone to do something about it. We've all been concerned about what's going on in Afghanistan. And I know you were involved with the evacuations of Afghanis and Americans from Afghanistan. You may say a little bit about that, but I think that the bigger question is, do governments support the Taliban to get money into the country, but yet we all distrust the Taliban. So you talked about how difficult it is to get money into the country. How do we, how do we best go about supporting the extraordinary needs in that country? So I think that the US government, this is at the highest level, makes a distinction between the Afghan people 
the Afghan government and the Taliban. The government, you could fund a group of teachers who are running schools or administrators who are in essence providing basic services to communities. You could fund infrastructure that's been set up by the World Bank and others and NGOs that provide food assistance or basic goods or help farming or farmers get their crops in the ground. All of those things can be funded without touching the Taliban. And they can be funded in ways that the Taliban have no access to those resources. In fact, our challenge is actually the Taliban is interested in this funding. It wants this type of funding to come in. And since so many people who are skilled have left, the challenge has been, can you actually help them set up an infrastructure that meets anti-terrorism norms and bypasses themselves? And the West, we have the power to ensure that it will bypass the Taliban. Our challenge is less our concern that resources will get to the Taliban, but that so everyone, institutions, banks, others are afraid that if they work in Afghanistan, they will be punished by the United States with anti-terrorism laws and sanctions that could destroy institutions. And even though the US has changed the laws, the rules that work in Afghanistan, we have the right right now to work in Afghanistan, to just have discussions with the Taliban, to move resources, there is this hesitancy to do anything because of the fear of the war on terror. So we're in a slow negotiation process of treasury in helping them to find ways to move resources through the UN, through the World Bank, through quasi banking structures like Hawala's and so forth, we are getting money in. Our challenge is that we need to accelerate the volume of resources that gets in by the hundreds of millions of dollars if millions of people or else millions of people will starve. So that's the pressure we're feeling right now. But the concern of get money getting to Calif Taliban is not a real one to be concerned about because there are ways to effectively bypass them. We have moved lots of people out during the uh, rescue attempt to get people out of Kabul when the government fell. There were different types of visas and different types of permits to get out. If you worked for the US government directly, you had access. But if you were a human rights worker working for an NGO focusing on the rights of women, you may at best end up with a P2 access. But that is access that did not get you on a plane, did not get you to the US. So tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who wanted out did not get out. And the challenge is that many of them now have turned to, well, I can't leave, but at least I need to do something to help my own people. So they're trying to run programs to help individuals within their own country. And they're turning to us saying, where can we get the cash? Which brings us to the problem I raised before. Thank you. So I have Hamid and then Carl in line to ask a question. If anyone wants to write another question in the chat or raise your hand, please do. Hamid, please unmute. Now, good afternoon, Sam. If uh, Unitarian Church uh, had the vote for uh, sainthood, I will certainly nominate you. So you have my vote to become the, 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 the saint. Uh, Sam, I want to ask a naive question. Uh, you are doing heroic work and your organization are doing heroic work, but why not get involved in neighboring countries for Afghanistan, Iran, although it is, a, it is a despised and discarded country by the West, but Iran has much better ties with Afghanistan or even Pakistan uh, than, than any other country. Similarly, uh, for, for Burma, Myanmar, China shares the neighbor, uh, share, shares the border. Is it, or even Thailand, is it possible to have the, the cooperation from the neighboring countries? So first an observation, I'm one of you know, several million people working in this humanitarian infrastructure and the real heroes are the individuals in a country in difficult circumstances who tend to not be known, who are not speaking publicly. That's the true voice and the true face of humanitarian interventions. And the answer is yes, work in different countries. So there are US NGOs currently operating in Iran, 
providing support to camps for Afghanistan's and displaced individuals in Iran. There are ways that we could work across borders to move individuals. There are large programs that we're running with governments in Pakistan and others. But these governments don't want more Afghanis. And the Europeans certainly don't want a flood of Afghanis screaming towards Europe and creating great migrant crises there. So there's a massive political interest and political necessity to do something and to take the brave step to actually say, I am trying to release billions of dollars to get into Afghanistan after we lost the war to a group of individuals whose ideology and whose positions we abhor, but we are going to invest in the Afghan people because we owe them at least that. And we could do that through working with Iran. We could do that with working with other governments. The nature of the humanitarian enterprise is not that you don't work with horrible people or difficult governments or regimes. The fact is you work with everybody. When I was talking about working in Darfur, the difficult challenges is that you land in a plane. I was talking about villages that were burnt to the ground. And at the end of the runway, you see military helicopter gunships of the Sudanese government where the fact the gunships were just burning the villages to the ground. And you have to talk to the Sudanese government to try to create some space to have people, the most vulnerable people not suffer because of war. So it is not our job, the job of the diplomat to stop the wars. It is our job to create in the midst of war, in the midst of humanitarian uh, natural disasters is to create some hope, some possibility of people to rebuild their lives. And many times it is possible to do that. There are countless examples of individuals who have thrived and gotten out. But still, it's really an uphill battle. Thank you. Carl, on, you had a question about Ethiopia. Do you want to ask it? Yes, I wrote that in the chat, Sam. Um, again, the complexities of war that are facing within borders that the UN recognizes, the kind of ultimate decision uh, that they cannot intervene, normally speaking. but. You know, there was a situation in Ethiopia that civil war looked imminent as the degree in uh, military, uh, informal military was rapidly going towards Addis Ababa, the capital. Um, and you know, if that would have happened, your, your partner, your let's say your desired uh, recipient of need were these same military forces. So there's the complexity of the Ethiopian government trying to maintain, which is in a sense, a legitimately elected government and protecting civil war. So you're in there in one regard, trying to help in the Ethiopian government's point of view, the adversary and you know how strong armed governments also use different leverage. And one was actually to starve the people to make them weaker. So I'm, I'm just stating to the audience at large, the complexity that you, your organizations have your hearts and best interests, but in real politic, and just one little footnote within reading about the issue of these drones, the scary thing for the future is these weren't supplied by the major uh, military armaments co countries around the world. These are homemade, almost the type that UPS uses. And does this portend many problems in the future with war escalating in areas where your people are out in harm's way and so on? I think that it, it thanks for the, the context and political context and, and the, the complexity that you're sharing there. I think the the challenge, and this is what a humanitarian does, is distinguish between a people, an armed group, a group that claims to represent the people, a government, an elected government, all the political forces that in essence shape the dynamics inside a country. Our focus is when it comes to them is let us have access, let us work with, engage the communities that are the most harmed by this violence around us. Let us provide some degree of protection by individuals by being present there on the ground. Resources aren't going to flow through a rebel group or the Tigrayan government or the Ethiopian government. But the moment you start reducing war to as a war against a people, then you start moving into the ground of ethnic cleansing and genocide. 
And so our challenge is to insert ourselves in the midst of that and make it difficult to shine a light on, we're not saying who should win or who should not win this war or which side needs to have an advantage or not. We are saying that in, under international humanitarian law, there is a space for interventions that are solely focused on the basis of need. And what's interesting is you could negotiate with armed groups. In Darfur, I remember meeting someone from the National Committee of the Red Cross, and we're talking about how you got to a particular camp, and there were 26 different armed groups in the area. And you had to, in essence, negotiate with them to make the case that these were vehicles that were traveling with food assistance. Do you want your population simply to starve to death? And if you want simply a population to be destroyed, there's nothing we could do. But most armed groups, most, whether they are terrorists or others, actually want a people to respect and to need them and to work with them. So our challenge is to negotiate between two forces to do something about that, not who is right, who is wrong. I remember being in Gaza and um, there was NGOs feed about 30% of the population in Gaza. Our work is supported by the Israeli defense forces because they don't want Gazans to starve. We drove down inside Gaza between the wall and the line with the Israelis on one side and on the other side were the Hamas towers. Hamas wants us there because they don't want a population starving to death. Nothing that we're doing is resolving the conflict in Gaza and the complexities of that conflict. What we are doing is ensuring that hundreds of thousands of the Gazans Palestinians have some basic dignity, have some basic needs met in the midst of a war that will go on and on. And the alternative is what we're seeing in Tigray is when you can't show up, eventually we will look at this and say something really horrible has happened. Thank you. So Tim Phelps asks, Sam, surprised to hear you have organizations work in Iran. Can you tell us more about who is there and under what circumstances? Uh, International Medical Corps is working there. There's there, the circumstances, there, there are permits that you have to get from the U.S. government uh, to operate in camps. Uh, the same thing has been the case in North Korea uh, with the ability to do this. We, we have to negotiate uh, with Treasury, and I probably Treasury's anti-terrorism arms, one of their main interlocutors, at least our uh, organization is, in terms of why should a US organization be present in an environment where the US has no desire to help the country. But it comes back to, does the US have a humanitarian set of values? Do we want to do something for people? And so in this case, there were interventions after you know, one of the earthquakes in Iran, but other interventions uh, around uh, primarily uh, helping with Afghans on the border. Um, and those, you know, these are complex circumstances and sometimes we then are forced to pull out uh, and not operate because of Western norms and Western rules. And other times we're forced to pull out because the terrorist group is simply makes it impossible to operate. Um, again, it comes to trying to crack open that possibility to help a, a group of people who are in dire needs. Thank you. So Glenn Peppel asks, I'm wondering about Jose Andres and others' efforts. Do they ultimately undercut the work of traditional NGOs? And can those organizations be leveraged to move from triage to more sustained support? Yeah, I mean, these are I, I'm, these, these are such big, complex organizations. Jose is a total character and, and uh, uh, you know, great sort of star power that he brings and, and the feeding of people. I think he's captured a few things that make sense. There's obviously that chefs and others are great with food and they know where food is and they need to tap into local food systems. And one of the big evolutions that we've seen in food assistance is it's not grain coming from the United States to feed someone in Africa, it's grain or other 
foodstuffs coming from inside Africa or inside a community to somewhere else because you're tapping markets and moving resources within those markets and trying not to displace those markets. And so much of the food assistance, the World Food Program is actually coming out of locally procured uh, goods uh, that are increasing local capacity for people to food themselves, which is one of the reasons why other than conflict, we haven't had famine because we've been able to move food or in and around. What Jose does is, is you know, he, he responds when there's an immediate need. Here in the US, he's done a good job just in, in DC and other places. In Haiti, he did this. And as he's, his organization's grown, he's become more NGO-like and rather rapidly you get this this, this sort of learning curve. I saw the same thing with Sean Penn, who sort of camped himself out in the, was in a camp in Haiti and sort of critiquing NGOs about a year later, you know, meeting with him, he was trying to learn, like, how do you do this? How do you sustain this? How do you make this possible? Because eventually you start building an organization, an institution. And I think Jose's challenge is how do you remain scrappy and how can you pull this together by pulling groups of people? And I think the more different types of approaches we have to help human beings, the better. There's no one set way to do this. Large, complex NGOs have learned certain things. Newer entities come up and get themselves established. In many ways, it's sort of less groups in the West, but you know, BRAC coming out of, uh, of uh, uh, Bangladesh or Odesso in, the, in Kenya, or there's some other groups around the global south that have become more specialists in responding to these types of crises. So it's not a Western endeavor, but it's really a human endeavor of how do we figure out new ways to help someone uh, when they need that meal or roof over their head or the security of, uh, of having someone around them so that they feel they could sleep at night. Let me ask, and this may have to be the last uh, question, um, say a little bit more about the humanitarian infrastructure you described, the UN agencies collaborating with Red Cross and NGOs. Are the NGOs' voices heard? Is it an effective infrastructure? Is it a global infrastructure? Maybe talk a little bit about it. Well, I spend a lot of my time actually critiquing this infrastructure and having to make it better, but let me focus a bit on the other side of the thing. It's one of the few spaces where we're actually at the same table. So the Security Council some 30 years ago voted to establish an infrastructure that was made up of the heads of different UN agencies and realized the UN, when the World Food Program says it's delivering food, is trying to help, say, you know, feed a million people, that food is not going from the World Food Program to the mouth of someone who's being helped. In between is someone like CARE, Catholic Relief Services, or World Vision. There's an international NGO in that intermediary layer, and that international NGO in turn is working with local groups to get resources out. So we have a seat at the table. Um, there are three platforms. The Umbrella Organization Interaction represents the US. There's an umbrella organization, you know, two in Europe that represent there, and one that represents group around the world. And then uh, we negotiated so that I could have two other CEOs join me at that table. And we meet twice a year formally for a couple of days with the heads of, of the different UN agencies. What's been interesting during COVID is we were we meeting weekly. So I was talking with the head of UNICEF or UNHCR or the you know, head of the World Health Organization in weekly discussions of how do we collaborate differently? How do we move resources? We need to move $100 million into COVID into certain areas that have been hit. How do we get resources out to COVAX? How do we create a humanitarian buffer for vaccines for humanitarian environments? And how many hundreds of millions of dollars can move there? The fact that we're not seeing the money reaching the people, can we bypass UN bureaucracies to do this? So all these questions become daily conversations. And we'd find ourselves to some extent, yes, we have less power, we have less, in essence, formal legitimacy, but we're at the table. And I see a note here on how concrete ways to help. And I'm not driven to any particular organization, but if you go to interaction.org under members, there are 220 different organizations doing things. So if you type in Yemen, 
you will get a dozen or so organizations working in and around Yemen of ways to engage with them. UUSC is a member of Interaction, as are all different faith groups, uh, lots of different Islamic groups uh, uh, and organizations that are non-sectarian. So there are hundreds of organizations doing this work. Go with the one that you care the most about. Uh, we establish standards and norms so that you, if you are a member, you've had to go through a broad screening process. So tap us. Another place to go is the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. They distribute resources, again, around the world. A former colleague of mine is their CEO. So there's, you know, if you go to interaction at interaction.org, you'll find a list of hundreds of organizations and that could point you perhaps in the right direction. Well, Sam, I wanna thank you so much for the breadth and depth of what you've offered today, but importantly for the work you do on behalf of all of us really to support humanitarian assistance. It's so important. This was just fascinating. I wanna thank all of you for attending and to say it is being recorded. Uh, so if you'd like to hear the recording, if you came in late, you can always access the recording. Uh, Loretta, perhaps could you tell everybody how they can access the recording? Yes, good Thank afternoon. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sam, for your presentation. Uh, these recordings are posted on the Facebook group called um, Contemporary Issues Forum, and they're also posted on YouTube. You search Coffee Conversation Controversy, and that'll be the first entry that comes up on that list. And we also send it around to the committee, so if you contact one of the committee members, uh, we'll be able to get it to you. And Sam, I'll get you that uh, link as well. So thank you again, and reminder that next week we have another Contemporary Issues Forum with Peter Wilson, another RRUC member. So we'd love to have you join us then. Again, thank you, Sam. Thanks to all of you, and have a great day.